So doctors are amazing computer scientists. I would say with the kind of tinkering that we can do with human physiology, which is the most complicated machine, we are really amazing hackers. Do you know that it took about 84,000 processors put together into the Japanese supercomputer K to, stim to simulate just one second of human brain activity. And I'm not talking of the brains that are sitting here, I'm talking of regular vanilla brains. So, so if you are really worried about robots taking over the world or even taking over this event, we humans are in safe space. But seriously, 10 years back when I was finishing medical school, I didn't feel like I was a hacker of physiology. I didn't feel like that I could hack precisely disease back to health. And I was at a loss. So I took to science and I was happy that I did, I did it. And it was the era of big data. The big data was just beginning. Genomics revolution had begun with big data permeating into medicine. But there was a problem. Very few people here would know that I'm also an expert musician. Just watch me. I'm not sure if you could hear that, but that was the problem of the big data revolution. We thought that our physiologies and our health is a neatly laid out organized system. And if we had the data, we could actually create the music. But now we know that is not the case. So traditional data, which looked like the one on the left, was neatly organized. Medical research was neatly organized. Whereas now we know for sure that neither our physiologies nor the big data is neatly organized. It's like, it's messy. Actually, we are a mess. It's like the Einstein's messy desk. Nobody knows where are the connections, how to make those connections. And that's why I would say that doctors, biologists, engineers, biophysicists and biochemists really need to take up the science of data because after all we have the connections made up in the right side of our brain and from there it's just one leap onto the left side of the brain which is quantitative thinking. So what I'm going to do today is break up that quantitative thinking in, into three smaller steps that we can understand and take. These are phenotype deeply, approach systemically, and enable decisions. So if I were to ask you that the beating of our hearts resembles which of the images on the top, the left or the right, you might be surprised to know that our heart rate interbeat intervals do not resemble the periodic pattern on the left. They actually resemble the complex multitude of fractal patterns that are found all over the nature on the right, like the broccoli hair. So diversity and complexity are actually a measure of healthiness, of health. I enjoyed doing my PhD and while I was having fun with looking at these signals, we really found a use for it. We phenotyped the signals deeply and we found that these signals really held meaning for small airway disease, which is notoriously difficult to detect. So we could design a non-invasive marker of small, early small airway disease without doing biopsies. And this was based on the mathematics of the, how our respiratory trees behave. And we were able to show that this achieved unprecedented sensitivity, the resolution that you see on the right versus the standard techniques that you see on the left. So this is just one example of phenotyping deeply. But I would warn you that phenotyping deeply sometimes can get immersive. We can get lost in the patterns because the mathematics is beautiful. So here I come to the second principle that I use continuously in my data science, which is approach systemically. Look at the forest first, whether it makes sense, whether the bigger picture makes sense. And this I'm going to illustrate by our work on 200,000 patients' data collected on a single day all across India by Chess Research Foundation, Pune. 
we were skeptical because this was questionnaire based data. So I decided to do the checks by doing the big picture first, by doing networks analysis. And that's what we found. Each node here is a symptom or a disease. And you could see that in the bigger picture, diseases have friends. They form communities and they are in key influencers in this network, in this disease network, which we call the symptom. This symptom is the symptom of the pediatric age group of the Indian population. We imagined how would these networks change across the age group? How would they flow? We did just that by using computational techniques. And we found that on the x-axis here is the age groups, 0 to 10 and more than 60. You could see that these networks far formed loaded streamlines. The most loaded streamline is the respiratory streamline here. It's being the most prevalent. But look at circulatory in red. It becomes more loaded as we age and it merges with endocrine, which is diabetes most predominantly. That top uh, uh, streamline, thin streamline on the top is female genitalia. It gets loaded, it comes down, it merges with anemia, they stay together in the reproductive age group and then they separate out. Anemia of menstrual disorders is so hugely prevalent in India. And this big data was actually telling us some stories. But we didn't stop at stories. We decided to take it further to do machine learning and artificial intelligence models to really make predictions. Here is a Bayesian network analysis, which is an artificial intelligence model upon the same data. But what we did here was we combined that 2 lakh patient data together with the data available on LPG penetration into the country. Clean cooking fuel. And we found that we did the Bayesian networks analysis LPG penetration, which is in green, de novo comes out to be linked with obstructive airway disease. These are separate sources of data, remember. There's no crosstalk between them before the analysis. So what if this was just an incidental finding? The same techniques that allowed us to track dynamically the change in networks, we used here to track the stability of models. And that's what you see on the top by using bootstraps upon the same data, each seeing a different angle of the data, critical conditions like sepsis and bad outcomes, by using big data and the patterns that I just kind of showed you. So we will be using phenotyping deeply, approaching systemically, and enabling decisions to create alerts for the doctors. So where are we now? Since it is a full spectrum project, we have started in the data science right from the scratch. We are building up these resources, we are building up technologies, we, are build, we have built up 4,000 hours, 40,000 hours of continuously monitored data at the Department of Pediatrics over the last five months. But are we big yet? I would not say yes. My collaborator at Stanford School of Medicine has access to about 3.5 million hours of in continuous recording. But we are starting right from the scratch and we are injecting our domain expertise into the building up of the systems and also in building up of the models. So we'll be there soon. Those broccoli patterns that I showed earlier, they are actually enabling us to detect the stability of these patients in the ICUs, how stable they are. How wandering are their signatures? Do they relate to outcomes? For the real results on this, we'll have to wait a bit. Just like any full spectrum project, we have a great team and an amazing set of mentors. And I'm really proud of the team of doctors and engineers that is actually backing us. So what is the new pulse of medicine? Is it big data? Or is it data science? Or is it machine learning? I would say that the new pulse of medicine is you. All those who venture out into the next generation medicine and will create a difference. Let's make every beat count. Thanks very much.